as we look in your word, um, minister to our very souls, we pray, in the name of Jesus. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing a song together. My discussion. If um, if you have questions about any of the things as we're moving through the material, be sure and text me or email me or just call, and I'll do my best to address it um, in the teaching sessions. I had planned for it to go through um, next Wednesday night for the for the month of June. Um, my goodness, there's so much material. I don't, I don't know where to cut it off. It could easily go two months. But I, and I love this stuff about Israel. I just love it. But, but I'm, I also am aware that when you have like a one-hour teaching session, that's pretty, pretty long. And um, uh, somebody said one time, the heart can only endure as much as the seat can handle. <laughs> And so, uh, so I don't know if there's any truth to that, but if at any point you need to just get up and stretch or anything, you're welcome to. Um, where we left off the discussion last week in the year uh, 134 AD, the Romans renamed the area in and around Jerusalem as Syria, Palestina. And that's the first time Palestine was mentioned. That was in the year 134 AD. Um, that was a direct slap in the face to the Jewish people, is what it was. They didn't mean that it was a state as such. That didn't happen for many years. And then of course, as you, as you understand history, Muhammad wasn't born for six centuries after this. So just kind of do the math on the development of Arab people. Although there is an ancient culture the Palestinians that are thought of today are not those same ones. And uh, so it was just a slap in the face to Israel. It was like, you know, we're just going to taunt you. The Romans said, we're just going to taunt you with the name of your nemesis that always was a thorn in your flesh. And so they renamed it Syria, Palestinia. Um, they, they did not intend to bring the, the Philistines back in because in fact they were gone um, entirely decimated um, blended in integrated with all the people that had conquered them through the years so the Philistines were conquered by the Assyrians uh, by the Babylonians by the Romans um, and then in part blended in a little bit with the Jews because of some of the Instances where the, the Jewish people integrated with uh, against God's command with the Philistines. But tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the history. Well, it's really fun. Oh, my it's goodness. Really hard. That's not what I want. A result of what happened. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and show you this now. <laughs> this was from last night on the news. Make up the shortfall. American farmers are bringing their much needed skills to Israel's fields. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports. Here on Moshav Dekel near Gaza, war prevented farmers from harvesting this eggplant crop. All throughout history, dating all the way back to the ancient times, most people say that I was mentioning the Palestinians and the fact that the Jerusalem area was renamed Palestinia in 134 AD by the Romans, most people say that the Philistines actually uh, ceased to exist about five centuries before Christ. Um, and uh, in fact, even uh, Jeremiah says in one of his prophecies, they will be entirely cut off. Um, and that did definitely happen. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but I don't personally, I'm just speaking personally, I don't believe that they went away entirely. Um, what I mean by that, I guess you would say that in the spiritual sense, the, um, the Philistines have reemerged as the arch enemy, the nemesis of Israel in present day times. And um, 
uh, in some sense, with the intermixing of races, um, I think that they remain to this day. Uh, but here's the important point about that. To be certain, there is no Philistine slash Palestinian group that has a right to say this is our land. Not based upon history, not based upon 3,000 and even 5,000 and go back 6,000 years yeah. of history. Um, not in the Middle East. That is not their physical homeland. Um, Palestine was not a, a people per se, it was a land designation. So in fact, even uh, in the first part of the 20th century, many Jews considered themselves Palestinians because of the land they lived in. They were Jewish Palestinians. Um, in 1921, the British Empire controlled almost a quarter of the land of the entire planet Earth. Imagine that. The British Empire controlled 25% of the world. Uh, but they knew that wasn't sustainable, and so they introduced this plan to slowly begin to uh, give off land. They didn't just uh, walk away, though. They, they yeah. wanted to make sure that the borders benefited them, and, and uh, it led <laughs> to quite a lot of dissension, um, a lot of uh, disagreements uh, as the land was divided. Uh, interestingly, uh, it didn't happen until 1947, but uh, in, in 1921, when they first introduced the idea, um, the plan was for the Jews to get a small little portion of Israel, 8% of land mass, 8%, or no, I'm sorry, 20%, 8% would be designated for like um, international commerce and just maintaining portways and things like that. But the rest of it, uh, what would that be, 72% was going to be for the Arabs. Uh, in, in the original de declaration back in 1921, and the Arabs would have nothing to do with it. We're not going to have any Jews coming into this land. This is our land. And, I mean, they were fighting over it. Um, finally, in 1947, it was after the end of World War II when it finally happened. <coughs> and just to illustrate... Israel is not the only place where disputes happened. Um, you might know this from history, but I find it really interesting. India, uh, India was subdivided into India, Pakistan, and uh, Bangladesh. And those three countries, uh, Bangladesh has been pretty okay, but India and Pakistan still to this day, they fight, they argue, it's back and forth, it's a lot of heated uh, wars that happen. Uh, during that that transition into new borders, over 200,000 people died. I mean, just think about that. Over 200,000 people died in various conflicts. Some just disappeared. I mean, they're supposed to be moved from one part of the country to another, and they just they just disappeared. And so, um, but uh, so it wasn't just in Israel where this happened. Uh, that happened in other places. For instance. That same year, 1947, is the year that Syria and Jordan and Myanmar and Sri Lanka, all of those happened. Um, former British territories given over. Uh, but definitely one of the sticking points was when they divided up the land of Israel. And of course, that includes Gaza and the, the Palestinian territory. Um, and so... When the UN took it up again in 1947 and voted, you ought to go on online and just listen to the audio recording of how they voted. It's really amazing. Um, some people shouted, no! And some voted yes, and um, it did pass. But the Pakistanis and the Arabs stormed out of the room. They were so furious with it, and, and uh, still are, are angry to this day. Now I want to just give you a heads up that um, we're going to talk about, um, I, I find it really amazing to look at the five cities that are, uh, the cities that make up the Philistine territory from the Old Covenant. Uh, we'll, we'll talk through each one of them. Um, 
But I want to just point out first, uh, the video that I just showed you, here's Gaza Strip, and remember how we talked about two different settlements. One is um, a, a kibbutz right up in here, Kabarava. Another one would actually be off the screen right down here on the southern part. And it's a, a moshav that is called um, uh, ne Neva. And we talked about uh, both of those, those towns and how they were impacted by October 7th. Well, the video that we just watched, Stephanie and I just happened to see it last night. We're watching CBN like, oh my goodness, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, that, that little moshav is right down here. It's literally less than five miles from the town that we were talking about last week. I thought that is just truly remarkable. And um, I also want to mention that I just ran out of time. So at first you're going to think, man, he doesn't have... He doesn't have any slides for any of the sermon, uh, scriptures, but I do, just not this first portion. They'll, they'll start to come on the screen, but I'm just going to breeze through um, some of these uh, mentions. So, the Philistines in the Bible. Um, according to Genesis 10, the Philistines were descendants of Ham, one of Noah's sons. Um, did you know that that's been a real sticking point through the years? People have said, that's not true. That's not where the Philistines came from. You can't prove that. Well, in 2013, they excavated a cemetery in the uh, old Philistine territory. Over 100 skeletons they pulled up out of the grave and took their DNA samples, and they proved that they actually did come, uh, just like Genesis 10 says, Mitzrayim fathered Ludum, Anamim, Lahabim, Dektuhim, Parthshuhim, Kasluhim, and then, and those are. This is the King James version. Those are the names King James, uh, Kazlushian, and and then it says in parentheses, from whom came the Philistines, and then it says another town, and Kafortem. Uh, but uh, people who don't believe the Bible said for decades, I suppose for centuries, that's not true. The Philistines didn't come from there. That's, that would be more like over in Europe. They excavated this cemetery, they did the DNA samples, and they proved 100% correct, the Bible was right, always is, that actually the Philistines were a seafaring people that came from what would be Europe now, that were light complected, that came across the sea and to inhabit the coastland right in the area where they lived. Um, Genesis 26 talks about uh, the famine in the land and how that... Um, uh, you know, Abraham and Isaac, as they're traveling, they had to connect with uh, Philistine people and negotiate with Abimelech, who was a Philistine king, and uh, negotiated for their peace settlement there. Uh, in fact, Genesis 21 34 says that Abraham resided among the Philistines for a long time. I wonder what that was like. He was a peaceful man, he was a, a peaceable man with the people. Uh, this was before war times. Judges 10 tells us that the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. Um, so there is, um, if you were to look at the map and, and go way over here to the east, you come way off the map and you get into Jordan, there's a, a city still called Ammon, Jordan. The Ammonites are mentioned there. There's a an ancient connection with the Philistines with them as well. Uh, 1 Samuel 14 says that the war with the Philistines was so severe all of the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any warrior or any valiant, valiant man, he attached himself to him. And uh, even, you know this already, but the Philistines ended up killing Saul and Jonathan in battle. That was one of the darkest days in history for the, for the Israelites um, as they warred against them. King, King David uh, defeated who? Which giant? Goliath. Goliath. Goliath was a champion Philistine. And um, you're going to be amazed some of the things that we'll talk about here in a few moments. Um, uh, in, in fact, 1 Kings 4 uh, tells that uh, Solomon ruled over the kingdoms of the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt, and they brought tribute and they served Solomon all the days of his life. 
the Philistines paid tribute to Solomon and the Israelites. Isn't that amazing? Uh, there is a prophecy from Zephaniah that says, For Gaza, and we'll be talking about Gaza, we have been these last three weeks, but it says Gaza will be abandoned, and Ashkelon will become a desolation. The inhabitants of Ashdod will be driven out at noon, and Ekron will be uprooted. So, um, let's, let's talk for a moment about uh, the five cities of the, the Philistines. Here's Jerusalem, and uh, right over here, the most northern city, Ashdod, is still a city uh, that you can go and visit right to this day in, uh, in Israel. You can drive uh, about an hour across here if traffic's good, get to Ashdod. There's some really cool ruins that you can go and tour. Um, Ashdod um, is um, it's, it's known as the place where giants were. The giants of Anakim were there. That's Joshua 11.22. Uh, Ashdod, Ashdod was allotted to Judah. When, when the Israelites won the battle, this was supposed to be territory for Judah. But the Bible says that they failed to overtake them. They were unable to drive them out. And so Ashdod remained a Philistine stronghold. Um, um, 1 Samuel chapter 5, Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and placed it beside Dagon. Do you remember this story? This is quite amazing. So the ark of the covenant has been taken away from the people of Israel and taken into their territory, into Ashdod. Um, but uh, God... Uh, really judged them. They thought, oh, we got their, we got the Ark of the Covenant. You know, we got just what we wanted. No, they had uh, all kinds of problems. First thing that happened, they brought um, the Ark of the Covenant into their temple as if they're going to make it now. They're going to add it to their, their worship. And they put it in the presence of Dagon. And the next morning when they came over, Dagon had fallen down as if he was prostrated, worshiping the Ark of the Covenant. And they thought, well, that's weird. And they set it back up. And then the next morning when they came in, he fell down again. Except this time his head broke off and his arms and feet are detached. And they said, we got to get this Ark of the Covenant out of here. Get it out of here. We're cursed because of it. So... Um, Zechariah uh, 9 6 says, And a people of mixed origins will live in Ashdod, and I will eliminate the pride of the Philistines. Um, Ashdod was actually a recipient of a lot of different prophecies. We won't read them all, but Isaiah, Amos, Jeremiah, Zechariah. Um, however, Ashdod continued to be inhabited as the Jews intermarried with its inhabitants after their return from Babylon. It talks about this in Nehemiah chapter 13. And so, um, that's... Um, uh, let me get back to... Yeah, let's see. I, I did wrong. Where were we? Oh, I know. Um, in the New Testament, Ashdod is actually in the Greek language, it's, it's uh, pronounced Azotus. And so, in the book of Acts, look at this. Philip found himself at Azotus. He passed through. As he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea up here. Isn't that amazing? Just think about this. The apostle Philip preached to the people of Ashdod. I, I just find that so... Uh, amazing and encouraging. Um, uh, so this, that's the first city, but the second one is Ashkelon, and you can see it up here. Here's Ashdod and just a little south, south right here um, on the coast. And one of these, they're both probably about the same thick size. I think I remember reading that Ashkelon, this may not be correct, it might be about Ashdod, but I think it was Ashkelon is a city of 150,000 people now, right on the coast. Just absolutely beautiful. In fact, the oldest arch uh, of a city gate 
that you can still walk underneath in the world is there. It's 4,000 years old. And you can actually go and walk through it and just, I mean, imagine it's still standing uh, to this day. Um, but 1 Samuel 6, now these are the gold tumors which the Philistines returned as a guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. So it's giving us the five different cities. Uh, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, of course. This whole Gaza envelope, this whole strip right here is where the battles and tents. This is the headquarters for Hamas right down here. And so um, the other two um, right here in the middle is Gath. And right up here is Ekron. Those are the five cities of the ancient Philistines. And they were a thorn in the flesh to the Israelites all throughout historical times uh, up until the 5th century B.C. Um, first, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Your beauty, Israel, is slaughtered on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will celebrate. This was uh, really an interesting comment. It was made by King David. It was when Saul and Jonathan had died. And, and he's, he's saying, don't let the word even get out. Because we don't want them celebrating in the streets. Actually, they didn't have streets. The area he's talking about is the arch that I was just mentioning. And there was like a courtyard where all of the merchants would come right there on the water and they would buy things and sell things. And, and uh, David, David says, we do not want that to happen. Then the, the third city, let's talk about uh, Gaza for, for just a moment. Uh, Gaza is located south of Ashkelon and Ashdod. Uh, it's also right on the Mediterranean Ocean. Beautiful beach right there. Just it's just gorgeous. If you've seen any of the, the video of it, it's, it's a very coveted property. Um, and uh, it was one of the cities of, of what they call the Philistine Pentapolis. Uh, Penta means five, right? Uh, pentagon as a five-sided building. A pentagram, that five-star, five-point star. Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. Pentapolis is the five metropolitan areas known as, um, as the Philistine territory. Those five cities. Um, so um, Gaza uh, is way up on a hill. It's 200 feet off the valley floor. And when you, when you come up to it, you look up to it, it must be just awe-inspiring to see the fortress up on top of that hill. Uh, there were sand dunes between it and the sea, and uh, now they've built right out to the water, but in those days it was about two miles to the water from the main fortress of Gaza, and you could see up the sand dunes climbing 200 feet up to this secure site. They could see anybody coming from any direction on the water. Um, Remember the things that happened here at Gaza. Uh, Samson, Samson went there and he went to see a prostitute and he lay there and and uh, I don't understand the way that that it works. Honestly, Samson clearly was in sin, disobeying his parents, disobeying the commands of Scripture. He had taken vows as a Nazarite, certain things he wouldn't do, but he was, he was a, really living away from God. And yet, when he found himself in a predicament, I believe he was very serious when he would call upon God and say, God, let your Spirit come upon me. And when it did, amazing strength. And so, the thing that to remember about Gaza, this is where, this is where they thought they had him trapped. And Samson tore the city gate apart. I mean, just tore the door right off its hinges and took at least the large poles, the posts that held it, and carried it 
all the way from Gaza all the way up to uh, it was either either uh, Ekron or um, what is that one? Uh, Gath. I think it was all the way to Ekron because I remember that it was a, a distance of 42 miles that he carried this city gate. Can you just imagine the strength of Samson? Um, 42 miles he carried that thing and then uh, in at the end of the chapter uh, remember this um, it was also when he came back to Gaza there is where he said Lord let me die with the Philistines and he pushed over by the strength of the Lord pushed down their temple now he's his eyes have been gouged out he's blinded and probably blindfolded um, he, but his hair is beginning to grow back but more than that his spirit is beginning to grow back yeah. and and he cries out and I, I believe his prayer was I all the time people ask me is Samson in heaven did he commit suicide uh, this uh, my opinion uh, is not any more valuable than yours we all have our own opinion but this is just my opinion I believe he was praying, Lord, as an act of war, let me take out the Philistines. And more Philistines died in his death than died in all the years when he was uh, living. I mean, think of some of the exploits he did. Tied 300 foxes together, tail to tail, and set them off in the field and destroyed the crops of the Philistines. Took a jawbone of a donkey, y'all, and slaughtered. I, how many help me? Was six a thousand, was a thousand Philistines. Yeah. I I I saw it depicted in a recent movie about Samson that I felt was very well done, very close to scripture, very accurate. And I mean, he's just I I had never really just imaged it in my mind. One after another, he's just boom, boom, just taking them on, and they can't stop him, and they're just falling and falling. And when the scene ends, it's just a a massacre all over the valley. Um, Samson had some some great exploits, but um, yeah, that's that's one of them in Gaza. And then look at this Acts chapter eight. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, "Get ready and go south on the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza." <laughs> the Holy Spirit told Philip, "Go preach to the people in Gaza." Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Um, now, the, the fourth city, uh, let's talk about Gath for a moment. Gath is, uh, uh, this one is really um, technically, like if you go to what is locate, what is labeled as Gath on the map, the ancient Gath is about a mile and a half north of that, and it's, it's actually called Tel Esafi. So there's a city called Gath, and then up above Tel Asafi, uh, and and uh, you can you can get to it easily. Um, it's about 17 miles. I'm sorry, from uh, from Ashkelon to Gath, it's about 17 miles. You can you can go to this place, and they have in Gath the most amazing. They call it um, their Philistine Street. <laughs> What it basically is, it's just like um, they made a, I don't know, kind of like a museum, but just out on the street, and they gathered all these ancient Philistine artifacts, and you can just walk through them and see them. Um, one of the things they have there, um, they, they had over a thousand oil presses. Um, they, they were great exporters of olive oil. And um, they have demonstrations of what that would have looked like in the ancient times. But um, also one of the things is they've got these temple foundations, like the pillars. And uh, people that I've seen talk about it say that the ones that are here in Gath, those temple foundations, are definitely not the ones from Gaza, but the same exact era. And you can look at them and you can imagine this is the kind of thing that Samson would have knocked over when he was over there in, in Gaza. Uh, but it, it is um, truly remarkable. Um, it's a well-fortified city. Um, it wasn't until David 
uh, conquered it, then it became part of the Israelite kingdom. It was given to the Jews when they came to the land, but they had not been able to conquer. But David was able to conquer uh, Gath and bring it into Israel. <clears throat> um, Gath is remembered as the home of the great giant Goliath. Goliath was from Gath. And um, his, it has archaeological remains that are, are really unusual. There's a, I don't know the name of the couple, it's a husband-wife team. They do a lot of videos. You can search it on YouTube and, and go through uh, different cities. But they have been to Gath, and it is absolutely remarkable. They, they uncovered large stones, much larger than usual. The buildings would have been much taller and much wider, and the rooms were not the normal size rooms. They were very large rooms. They were built for giants. I mean, they clearly were built for large, tall, giant people. Um, first Chronicles 20, let's see here. Uh, first Samuel 17, okay. A champion came forward from the army encampment of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath. His height was six cubits and a span. And um, so some people say that, um, well, he couldn't have been that tall. Well, actually, there's people that tall even in modern times. Uh, the tallest man in the world right now is about eight foot ten. Um, the one that was from England all those years, he was eight foot eleven. Um, the thing about it, though, that a lot of times when people are super tall in current times, um, they have a disease where they can't stop growing. Uh, Stephanie and I know a beautiful family that we pastored in Colorado. Two of their sons are this way. They just they don't stop growing. They're really super tall. Uh, they've had to deal with all kinds of physical maladies with bones that break easily, poor eyesight, and, and things like this. Um, but I don't, I don't believe that's what was going on with Goliath because it says he was a champion warrior. I mean, he was undefeated. And um, there's descriptions of him that just really make it seem like he was... The way I picture it, like, um, take Shaquille O'Neal or uh, one of the superstars, you know, like uh, uh, Yachts... That's it, Porzingis. What is his first name, baby? It's I can't say his name right now. But anyway, he's seven foot three. Um, he's he is he's skinny. Like I mean, he's muscular for how tall he is. But he just looks so thin. Um, what the one guy that plays for San Antonio, the rookie sensation, Wim, Wimbanyama, seven foot five, athletic, cut. He can dribble the basketball through his legs and behind his back. He's like a, a short point guard, only he's seven foot five. But I imagine something like that, only add a foot and a half to it and add muscle to it. Right. And um, he was a true champion. Uh, look at this verse. This is 1 Samuel 5.10. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And as the ark of God came to Ekron, the Ekron, Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So now we're going we're gonna to take time to read the scripture uh, that goes along with this in just a moment. But first, Ashdod had the ark, and Dagon fell and broke his neck, and they're like, Get him out of here. They, they sent it down here to Ashkelon, and it stayed there for several months. The people of Ashkelon didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, they, they came under uh, severe sickness. They sent it now to, uh, to Ekron. And here at Ekron, they're crying out, we don't want anything to do with this. Get it out of here. And so what they did, all five of the uh, Pentopolis, all five of them fashioned a tumor made out of gold and put it in the ark and and they uh, kind of they they made a wager we're going to send it towards the road to Israel 
If it veers off and goes down this direction, then it wasn't anything from God. But if those cows, if they just walk straight into Israeli territory, then we will know that God has sent the judgment. And so we know that, you know from the story, that actually the cows went not just not just walking, but lowing as they went. That are coming over the hills and dropping down in the valley. And then uh, let's let's read this whole account. Now the people of, of Beth Shemesh were gathering in the wheat of the harvest of the valley. And they raised their eyes and they saw the ark and they rejoiced in seeing it at seeing it. And the cart came into the field of Beth Shemesh and stopped there where there was a large stone. And they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down uh, the Lord and the saddlebag that was with it. Uh, should, uh, should that say the load of the saddlebag that was with it? In which there were articles of gold and put them on the large stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed that day to the Lord. When the five governors of the Philistines saw it, they returned to Ekron that day. So can you just imagine what a great victory this was uh, for the for the people of Israel. So Ekron is uh, located 13 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. They have a hundred oil presses there. Um, they they identify the site clearly as being a Philistine territory. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip to this section here. So let's, I want to spend a little bit of time um, to talk about the thing that we've been mentioning the last several weeks to bring it more into modern time. That, to me, that is so just encouraging to see that this is not something recent. It's been going on for many, many years and um, the people of Israel were very, very blessed. Of course, that hasn't always been the, the case. The Jews have been mistreated, uh, displaced, sent um, out through the diaspora, scattered to the nations. Uh, no, no other nation, no other nationality in the entire history of humanity has ever survived being disbanded for 2,000 years just wandering as nomads and then to reassemble. I mean, just think of the miracle that this is. It's an incredible miracle. Um, and that happened for the, for the Jewish people. Um, but let's talk about the difference between uh, the kibbutz and the moshav. The kibbutzim are settlement towns uh, all over Israel, they're north and to south, they're all throughout this area, and they are definitely government-sponsored socialist cities. Uh, everybody dresses alike, everybody lives in the same home, they have a, a community family system where the kids are raised by the, the city. Parents spend only a couple of hours with their kids each day. That would drive me crazy. But um, there are uh, today 270 kibbutzim in Israel. And um, primarily their goal is to, to be farmers. Um, although in recent years they've started producing plastics and other kinds of things. And they're uh, kind of changing on that. But then the other one is the Moshav, and a Moshav is, is also a settlement, and they're also scattered all throughout Israel, all throughout this territory. But it's definitely not socialist. It's more of a, more emphasis on the farming, and it is, um, it's definitely also more spiritual in nature. These are really committed, uh, traditional Jewish people looking for the Messiah to come, studying Torah, practicing um, the commandments. And so I said there's 270 
uh, kibbutzim in Israel, as of 2018, there were 451 moshavim in Israel. And so that's, I mean, you're talking about over 700 settlements all through this land. And um, I wish I had got a picture. I didn't get it on. Maybe I'll show you next week. But the, the thing about the Mashav, um, it, it's the most unique uh, agriculture farmland that I've seen. And they're all over Israel. It's, it's round and circular. And we have certainly some circular farms in America. But that's only in the center where the buildings are. But then as it spreads out, there's strips of land all the way around, and they each belong to different families. And they farm those territories. Uh, when you do an aerial photo, it is just remarkable. It, it looks like, uh, like a ray of sunshine just shining out, because you can clearly see all the different colors uh, coming out from that center area. And uh, it's really, really remarkable. But here's one story that I wanted to share about this family, the Sidbon family, the Mashab they live in is, is named Dekel. And it just so happens that the video that we watched earlier um, is from their Mashab. Um, the, the video of the people from, from the United States going over to pick crops uh, in Dekel, that, that happened in their, in their community. Um, that is um, Ahi, the husband, and her name is Yafit. Um, that's an old picture of her with their four children. Um, that was probably like 10 years ago. Um, but this is off an article that I pulled up for them. They raise peppers and tomatoes. That's what they do. Their strip of land is peppers and tomatoes. And they're very successful at it. They've been really successful through the years. And um, as I mentioned to you earlier, the, the Mojave that they, that they live in is, is right way down south by Gaza. It, it's really off the screen. It would be way down here. We talked about another one a couple of weeks ago that became a triage center on October 7th for all the victims that came. Well, some of the, some of the victims came from, um, from DeKalb. And... Um, this was their experience. Um, they, they all survived. But on October 7th, in the early morning, they heard the bombs going off. They um, ran to the, uh, the safe room. Uh, each, in, their, in their mashab, each family has a safe room. They went to it, and uh, the husband is a warrior, and he grabbed his, his rifle, and his instructions to his wife were, do not leave here under any circumstance, stay here. So he left, and usually when a bomb happens or a spray of gunfire, gunfire, it's a real short thing, but this went on and on and on and on for hours and hours. And she didn't know where her husband was. She could hear the gunfire getting closer. She had looked outside enough to know that um, it, it definitely was Hamas. They were coming into their village and it, just killing people indiscriminately and, and just um, throwing bombs, gunfire, assault rifles, rifles, automatic rifles, just unloading on people. And they were just systematically working through the town. And um, the kids, her four kids, could hear the gunfire getting closer and she just said to them, Oh, that's our Israeli army out there. They're defending us. But she knew that wasn't true. Um, but she didn't know what to do. And at one point, she even decided, um, we need to make a run for it. We need to try to evacuate. I don't know where my husband is. Is my husband still alive? He told me to stay here no matter what. But about that time, her husband showed back up. And if you can imagine this, handed his rifle to her and said, if anyone comes in, shoot. I've got to leave and go be with the army again. I mean, can you imagine what that would be like for this mom and the 
the four kiddos, and um, and she so she did, and he emphasized again, no matter what, stay here. And so it was a good thing that she didn't leave because the route she would have taken, um, she found out later that uh, some other families that she knew. As they took the escape route, they became sitting ducks because when they came to the opening, there were the Hamas soldiers just with assault rifles and they just unloaded on them and, and killed them. Uh, in fact, one entire family was killed on October 7th and three of them have been her students. She's a school teacher and she knew those kids. Um, so... Um, they waited all night, and then eventually they decided um, that we will go ahead and evacuate, and others got a, a plan, and, and um, they they exited through what is called um, the Philadelphia Philadelphia route. So where they live is right here, and and they went this direction and and were um, if I understand it correctly circled back around to get over to another Meshav but uh, the, the Philadelphia uh, route that this is in the news has been in the news a lot you've probably heard of this this is the main port of entry to get into Gaza uh, the Israelites took control of this at the end of December. Uh, there was a lot of bickering and contention by Egypt. You can't, you can't have control of that, but they knew they had to have control of this because that is the main way that Hamas gets in and out of Gaza Strip. Uh, there is a, a large entry gate like you would see in any port city, but the main thing is there's tunnels under the ground that are hidden that, that connect Egypt with the Gaza Strip and um, so that was one of the one of the things that Israel they wanted to make sure uh, and took over um, this this family here let's see if we can get it to go forward yeah um, I, I talked about Zion Lashim he lives him and his, he and his family, they live five miles from the other family that we showed. And um, we talked about them last week. They, they live in another Meshav just down the way. And he's the one that jokingly when he was interviewed, he said, um, my, my son, my youngest son, very well could be the Messiah. And they pushed him on away. Whoa, what do you mean when you say that? And he said, well, you... You don't really mean that, do you? You're saying that. You're just joking. You don't mean he's the Messiah. And he said, "Well, probably not. But would I be a would I be a good Jew if I didn't believe my son could be the Messiah?" <laughs> so he, but he's a, a a Jewish man that's living under the Old Testament code that doesn't know his Messiah has already yeah. come, and he is Jesus. But I'm really impressed with them. What a wonderful family. But here's what he said. We believe, and this is what the Torah teaches us, that re the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel and construction of the state of Israel, the fact that the state of Israel is strong and getting stronger and growing, and at the end of the day, the whole Jewish people will be coming here, turning the land into something that's giving fruit and giving produce and together with our Torah studies and our religious communal life that's our mission this was um, kind of what we were talking about last week and really it's dovetailing on that and just finishing the thought why would you stay in the desert risking your life it's because they truly believe that this is the land that God gave us and it is interesting if you compare the physical land of Israel from 1948 to present, it has flourished. It's not wide open stretches of desert any longer. Now there are fruit trees. There are grape vineyards. There's strawberries. I mean, they're, they're changing the land. 
um, as a people they belong to the land and the land belongs to them um, and then let's let's end with um, Rabbi Pufka uh, I guess there was more to the quote um, yeah we feel that we're part of something much bigger with this specific event talking about October 7th as horrific it has as it has been it doesn't change anything we're farmers Farmers are connected to the land. We don't have the privilege of just giving up. It's not happening. And then uh, a quote from Rabbi Pufka. Why do we have a land? The answer is really very simple. If you go back to the Torah, the 70 nations come out of the three children of Noah after the flood. Each one is assigned a land. And the last one to get a piece of land is a fellow by the name of Abraham and his wife Sarai. But why does monotheism, a religion, need a land? Um, the answer is very simple. Um, Judaism and its mitzvah of commandments is about the sanctity of normalcy. What does the sanctity of normalcy mean? We are here in this world to maintain God's harmony of creation as it was when the sun set on the sixth day of creation right before the first Shabbat. You do that through a life of justice, righteousness, holiness, and purity. If you want to be a light to the nations, you have to function like a nation. And therefore, we need a land to live a normal life like any other nation but live it according to God's commandments. Um, I'm going to close with a few comments about the miracle that has happened in Israel um, in very recent history. Uh, perhaps within some of our lifetimes this has happened. This is remarkable and amazing. Many people who analyze the conflict the war between Arabs and Israel in 1948, call it a miracle. I mean, just an absolute miracle. Victory, victory for the Israelis was hardly something that they could be assured of. They had no air force, uh, very little in the way of artillery, and they only had three tanks. And yet, this army, made up of refugees, Holocaust survivors and World War II veterans managed to repel an invasion of four armies with more than 200 tanks and 300 aircraft. As remarkable as it was, it would pale in comparison to another victory that came two decades later. Um, in May of 1967, Egypt's president, President Nasser, started escalating hostilities towards Israel, cutting off crucial shipping lanes, and, and um, uh, he was signaling that war was imminent. Uh, he ordered the peacekeeping people from the United Nations to get out of the Sinai Peninsula, and it shocked the world. Um, but, Israel struck first. On June 5th, 1967, the Israeli Air Force essentially wiped out the Egyptian Air Force while it was still on the runways in Egypt. And they began a brutal assault on the Egyptian forces that had taken positions in the Sinai Desert. But even though Israel was clearly winning the war, President Nasser from Egypt, he, he went on the radio and said the exact opposite. Oh, we're destroying Israel. We've got the upper hand on them. And so it caused Jordan, Israel's neighbor to the east, the ones who occupied the West Bank, to attack Israel. And so here you've got them coming from all directions at Israel. Um, but Israel was blessed by God. Do you know that my mom told me before she died, this is 
long time before she died. I heard her talk about how as a little girl she remembers seeing a news broadcast of angels on the wings of the airplanes of Israel during that six day war. I've researched that, I've seen little comments here and there. I wish I could find that story if it's documented, but God was definitely with them during those six days, uh, June 5th to June, uh, June 10th. And on June 7th, there was, of 1967, just a few more, few months before this lady was born, I'm not going to tell you how old she is, but there was a reporter that was traveling with Israel, with the Israeli troops, and they did a live broadcast as they went into the city of Jerusalem toward the western wall of the temple. The, the troops captured the western wall and they actually went in, imagine this, they had not been allowed to pray at the wall for 19 years. They had been a state since 1948, but they had not been allowed to come in and pray at the, at the Wailing Wall. And, but uh, on that day, they took it over. And not only that, but on that same day, they liberated all of not just the wall but even more importantly up above the wall on the temple mount and the whole area that is um, referred to as al-aqsa mosque the the dome of the rock they took control of that whole territory this was june 7th 1967. Uh, the defense minister was watching through binoculars from two miles away and he sees the Israeli troops climb on top of the Dome of the Rock and they erected the Israeli flag up there. I mean, can you imagine? And he got on the blower immediately. He says, do you want to set the whole Middle East on fire? Take that down. <laughs> and they took it down. And a couple of weeks later, just in one of the most bizarre scenes, they gave the Dome of Rock back to the Muslim people. Just handed it back to them. The Israelites don't get credit for that. But I mean, that was a remarkable moment in history. I, I'm going to end with um, this quote by Yossi Klein Alevi. Um, the most secular Jew on the morning of June 7th, he's talking about 1967, felt the spiritual uplift that he probably couldn't even name. But I saw it happen with my father who was a Holocaust survivor and after the Holocaust left religion. He had come from a religious family. The way he put it to me, God doesn't deserve my prayers. It's a Jewish kind of rebellion religion. It's not that I don't believe in God. I do believe in God, which is why I'm not going to pray to Him, because God could have stopped it. Now, that's not very mature. It's not the way we should ever approach God. But it is honest on His part. This was His dad. And the moment the parachute troopers return to the wall is the, is the moment where my father felt Okay, I can forgive God now. And he became deeply religious after that. And what happened to him, I feel, was really in some ways emblematic of what happened to the Jewish world in general. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a, a good place to start to stop, and I'm going to try to remember where to pick up and going into uh, next week. But I want you just I want you to just think about how the Jewish people. What a turnaround for Israel from the time of Hitler to present day. What a change! And you know what? The, the amazing thing is that. The people of Israel, their warriors refused to become victims. 
they won't just, they will not lay down and just be victims. They're going to stand for what they believe in. And uh, the thing about it that's so amazing is you go from being uh, victimized in the Holocaust, six million Jews killed in concentration camps. How horrible. They could have curled up and just died and said, you know what, we give up. But they refused to be victims. And in the 80 years since, not only have they recovered, but they have gained ground. And some Jewish people, up until October 7th, 2023, were saying, we went from our lowest point to our peak in our entire 2,000 year history from the time of Christ until, until present. That's my language. They wouldn't, of course, they would say back to the days of Solomon in the original temple. But they are remarkably blessed. I, I'm going to talk next week about things that I promised last week I would talk about. I never got to it. But next week we're going to talk about uh, Muhammad's night vision. We're going to talk about how there are neat, easy conversation. Um, 